Namaste and welcome to this exciting new episode of Satology Debunking Mythology. We have been continuing our series of Western calendars and why we have to give reference to Western calendars so that we can understand the currentness of our age. Now, uh, the Indian calendars have always been different. Before that, just to remind you, Sat means truth. Sat, uh, so some people are saying Sat, something else. I cannot use the word Satya. Satya is a word made from the root. So whenever we have to coin a new word, we have to use the root of the Sanskrit, just like mythology has used. Satva, Satology means science of truth and mythology means science of fake imagination or untruth. So today in, in, in our discourses in Satology on discussions that we have, we always try to bring the most objective, realistic, commonsensical and scientific analysis of the ancient history. And the reason why we do that is that the ancient history guides us. If you do not learn from history, the history it becomes, we do not learn anything. Like we have to learn from the past, whether good behavior or bad behavior. So there is another concept called avidya and vidya. We'll come back to that later on. But today I have a very, very special guest, a Rishi Muni researcher. And I'll today add one more title to him called Pandit. So... So without delay, let us welcome to Nilesh Nilkant Oak. Namaskar Aditya Ji. And, and Sat means uh, what is. And uh, this is to be something that we, the, all the Grantha, all the literature can assist us. But at the end of the day, Sat is something to be experienced. What is. Okay, because I think the language has its limitations in describing something like whether it's a gulab jamun or certain mango ice cream, you know, you can describe as much as you want, but finally you really want to experience the taste of it. Yes, no, uh, good point. And the one of the biggest things in the campus is, and I've discussed with many people on this show, in these shows, is a critical race theory and inclusion. We covered part of it last time. Uh, inclusion of class. <laughs> Now, caste is a Portuguese word. It has nothing to do with India. And the Indian word is Varna. And uh, like you said, there are Chaurasi like Yoni. And the subset of Yoni is Jati. So what is that, according to you, the difference between the Jati and Varna? And then we will debunk the caste. Okay. Yeah. So first thing, as you said correctly, the caste is out. Okay. Uh, that is a class. It comes from a class. Like England had a class. Most of the European societies had classes. And uh, now, I mean, that came to India also. I mean, they brought it to India. The, only the funny part is uh, anytime there is a discussions anywhere around the world about India, it's, it gets into that caste cow and curry, you know, which India has nothing to do with it. Now, that is not to say that no matter which society, the society would always have problems. And, you know, we can see uh, even with the Varna and, uh, Varna and Jati, and uh, you can have that. I mean, there is always a distinction, right? Even the regionalism, right? I mean, say within India or here, I mean, in America, don't we talk about the Southern folks versus the Northeast versus the West Coast, you know? I mean, you can always find a way to distinguish. As far as the Varna and Jati, even, and we can just talk Varna, but even Varna Jati together, and there is an ashrama also, like different stages in life. Similarly, different groups in the society and the groups for what? I think the, it's very, very scientific. Uh, in the Japanese tradition, they have this uh, uh, framework called Ikigai, you know, balancing your life. You know, It's like, what is it that you love to do? What is it that society requires? What is it that you are good at? And what is it that you can provide the value, meaning how you can get your sustenance? And you bringing these four things together is they what they call Ikigai. Now, when Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, uh, uh, talking about the Varna, Chatur Varnam Maya Srishtam Guna Karma Vibhagasha, okay, based on your natural inclination and based on your ability. So I may have an inclination, but not ability. I may have an ability, but no inclination. And these two, again, then combined with what is really required at that time, place uh, to the society, to your family, to the nation, uh, to the bigger good. Bringing that together is the Varna. 
okay ashram is like every one of us will go through the different stages of life when you are young you are learning then you are a contributing member to the society then you take a mentoring role like you mentioned you know how you are mentoring at the crm uh, in a certain place at some point you know you take a mentoring role and at another times you take a philosophical role even you want to get out of the mentoring uh, role but you can uh, do the reflections and you know get together your learnings for the posterity like ben franklin writing his autobiography or something like this and jati last one quickly the jati is simply a professional societies or professionalism so if you are teaching the professor is a jati you know the person who is uh, working in the consumer industry is a jati the person who works in manufacturing is another jati the engineer is a jati and a doctor is a jati that's what it really meant originally because the education was done from Uh, like uh, uh, the previous generation to the next generation and it was a most efficient effective way of uh, uh, what you say instructing the next generation into that so if the doctor for a doctor it's very easy to teach his children how to be a doctor so in that very soft directional sense the varna jati and ashrama was organized no this this particular uh the controversy has been created for political reasons it has nothing to do with academics or the facts on the ground in fact uh, discrimination on the basis of birth has is not there in most of the indian societies uh, in because india is a large country like there are five four four united states or more than 4.5 united states in one country so it's like a combined population of europe and you entire north america is inside one country called india so just imagine how many divisions are there in europe and within usa how many divisions are there and if somebody thinks that human rights violation don't happen in america or usa they are living in denial and i'm not even covering canada which has unearthed a huge problem now mm-hmm. and also mexico mexico has a huge discrimination against the native mexicans so just singling out india or hindus general it's a racial or it's itself a human rights violation or a racist concept you know so this is what my view on that and and we can talk with facts i can we can list down and what things that we need to focus on what is your view on that and then then we start the presentation okay so i no, well i agree with you and uh, i'm saying singling it out is like only comes out of ignorance because you know i think people just stand in front of the mirror and you know look at uh, uh, our own society wherever we are here uh, now you, you can you can give the credit to america in general like the american psyche uh, that in spite of the problems that we have um, america because it's a relatively new country it uh, and it uh, over the years welcome people it remains a open society but then also we have to understand every one of us needs to understand that there is a mechanism in place there are vested interest who wants to divide the society into a uh, subgroup of one like you want to divide the society across the colors across the regions across the gender across the education uh, you know you want to find that is the postmodernist view to to divide them into as many subgroups as you can almost like a subgroup of a one uh, that is their ideal i would say and why do they want to do that because they can control people well this is not a ideology or agenda for one particular party or anything like this or not even just limited to political parties at all it is just there i mean if people have open eyes they they will able to see it yeah exactly. and quickly i should add i don't know if you are aware aditya ji if you listen to this uh, the uh, oxford case that uh, what's her name samant right she yes. was she was treated uh, in a very unfair way she yes. was uh, the head of uh, she won the students election and uh, today uh, oxford university today or yesterday oxford university admitted the wrong doing and the discrimination that was specifically targeted at her because she is hindu oh you, yeah it it today it just came out yesterday and and as you may know one of your guests satish sharma ji who uh, really did a great job as usual so so we can start the uh, presentation ji okay and- we are discussing the third part of the western calendar Correct. we should compare it is for practical reasons 
Yeah. Third and the last part today on, on this one. So we started with why do we use a uh, Western calendar? Now, this is sometimes not everyone asks this question, but uh, typically uh, this is a frequently asked questions, especially for those who are uh, studying Indian history, deep ancient Indian history. And they wonder before any of these calendars came into being like a, a Julian calendar, which is what only 2000 years old, 45 BCE. Gregorian calendar, which is only what, uh, 400 years old, like what was there before and why do we not use it? And to answer that, I said, because uh, in order to have a good reference, we do need a tropical solar calendar. And as it exists today, at least as it existed, existed today or exists today, there is only one, truly one, okay, that is functional and that is understood across the globe. Uh, because partly because of colonialism and the British influence, but it is the Gregorian calendar. Okay, uh, even British did not accept Gregorian calendar for a long time, so that's why it is there. It's a purely tropical calendar. It's a very nice functional calendar. So nothing wrong with it. Now they uh, the the people raise these questions, Adityaji, not just in India, everywhere, is because now what is the name? What is there in the name Gregorian? That comes from Pope Gregory, you know. And uh, he was instrumental behind the change of calendar from Julian to uh, this new calendar, which was named after him in 1582. Uh, so it has that religious bias. That's what people think. And in a way it is, because when we talk of this year being 2021, it goes back to the fact that uh, 2021 years ago, there is a claim that Jesus existed or Jesus was born and so on. So many people don't like that a very specific religious connotation attached to the calendar. And I think that's why they ask the questions. My point is uh, that may be so, actually that is true. However, you cannot just complain about an existing calendar unless you have a better alternative better alternative. And I'm going to show you what the better alternative is, but just like any new system, when a new program comes, okay, or new law comes, or we go to new country, like if somebody going from America to India or Australia or UK, they have to learn some different things, how they drive the car. So there is some initial work that needs to be done if we want to go for a better calendar. It will take a lot of effort. In fact, somebody asked me, uh, some time ago, he says, uh, Nilajji, so how long will it take if you want to really implement this calendar, which uh, I call it Bharat Dinadarshika? And uh, I said, even if instantaneously, let's say, um, forget the world for a minute, just uh, everyone in India, including the government, agrees to it. Uh, and then we, the world won't be any different. But it would, just for India, let's say, it would take 20 years. That's what I'm saying. It's not... The availability of a calendar, that is the issue I'm going to show you. It's already there. It is updated. Uh, the Every day's calendar is posted every morning, 5.30 in the morning, India time. And it can be easily turned into an application. That is the whole idea. And there are some efforts underway. But even if the application is ready, and if people don't do the active Swadharma, what they must do, each, which is to become familiar with this calendar, embrace it, nothing will change. But then we also looked at the Gregorian calendar and then the Julian calendar. The beauty of Gregorian calendar, that's why we call it a purely tropical and a well done uh, tropical solar calendar, is that its only purpose, in fact, the purpose is to ensure that the day of the winter solstice, summer solstice, fall equinox, spring equinox, fall on the exactly same days in this 365 days calendar. Okay, so I'm going to go fast through this. And why do they do that? Because the seasons are directly connected with the tropical calendar. Because these four cardinal points define when a season begins, when you get to the middle point of the season, when season ends, okay? And I, what I've done is I've superimposed the six seasons of Indian system. So beginning with the Vasanta, Grishma, Varsha, Sharad, Hemanta, and Shishir, or loosely translated, Vasanta is like a spring, Grishma is like summer, Varsha is like a rainy season, Sharad is like pre-autumn season, Hemanta is an autumn season, and Shishira is a winter season. Each season of approximately two months each. 
Then we looked at Julian calendar. Why? Because Gregorian calendar came from Julian calendar. But also, when we look at the ancient history, anything happening before 1582 CE, by convention, people use Julian calendar, and therefore, we must be familiar with it. We looked at Julian calendar look exactly like a Gregorian calendar. If you would have gone back to 45 BC, when Julius Caesar supposedly initiated this calendar, there is a small gap between these two calendars of 0 0.0078 days per year. It's not a big number, but over a period of time, it really adds up, okay? And therefore, the Gregorian calendar came into being because to avoid the shift in the days of cardinal points. How much is that shift? That shift is about one day in the calendar every 128 years. This is in spite of adding the leap years, huh? okay? In fact, it makes an overcorrection. So we looked at that. And then I also showed with some example that what if we would have not changed to Gregorian calendar and just continued with the Julian calendar to say our times, what would have happened is that instead of 21st June being the uh, day of summer solstice longest day, it would have actually occurred on the 4th of June. Now, either we would have realized it, which we should have and said, oh, now it's no longer 21st June is the summer solstice, but 4th of June. Or if you would have continued to say celebrate 21st June as the longest day, then really we would be making a mistake, error, because the longest day, the day of summer solstice would have been 4th June, but we are thinking still it's 21st June after 2000 years. So idea is not that uh, getting overwhelmed by this, but just to understand some of the corrections we need to do. Now, we don't follow Julian calendar uh, in our times anyways. It just tells you how to calculate that correction, okay? So total number of years from 45 BC, the gap is divided by 128 days, 28 years. That tells you the shift in the days that we need to use to correct against our Gregorian calendar that we are used to. This is what if you would have used it to our times, we don't do it. Now imagine because by convention, we use the Julian calendar to study the events or provide the specific year for ancient events anywhere around the world. By convention, we use a Julian calendar and therefore we need to understand the errors, okay, or the changes from the typical numbers that we are used to in our mind, like 20th, 21st of March, 21st of September, 21st of June and December and so on. So I showed two examples. For example, if we go back like to the Mahabharata times, more than 7,500 years ago to specifically 5561 BCE, then what we would have found, and that is actually shown in my books, and you know, not a surprise, nothing complicated about this, that actually, and in the year of Mahabharata war, the day of winter solstice, which in Gregorian calendar in our times comes on the 21st of December, like 21st, 22nd of December, 7,500 years ago, in the Julian calendar, the day of winter solstice was around 1st of February. And keep in mind, 1st of February plus minus two, three days. In the year 5560, uh, BCE, when Bhishma passed away on the bed of arrows after spending more than 92 days, that day was 31st January 5560 BC. If we go further back to say Ramayana times, that's going back to uh, more than 14,000 years ago, we will actually find a bigger shift. Why? Because we are going from the reference point of Julian calendar of 45 BC to what? 14,000 or 12,000 years in the, in the past. How do we calculate that? Same formula. We just note down the difference between 45 BC and the year and divide that number by 128 years because that's the time there's a shift of one day. It comes to a shift of 95 days. And you can see what that happens in the Julian calendar. That should explain to people why uh, Rama's birth, Okay, Rama was born in the month of Chaitra and Chaitra Shukla Naomi. In our times, it comes in, in springtime. During the Ramayana times, Chaitra occurred during the Sharad Rutu. But not only that, on the Julian calendar, it was not around 21st September, but rather it was around 24 December. 
Once you understand that the fall equinox, the pre-autumn season was around 24 December in that calendar, okay, the season is what it is, but as a calendar computation, then you exactly understand why Rama's birth date is 29 November 12,240 BC. What does that mean? He was born in sort of, you can say, the early part, the first half of um, the Sharad Rutu, the pre-autumn season uh, in, in, in that time. When he uh, left for uh, the Vanavas, 14 years of exile in the forest, that day was around that uh, 21 December or whatever it is, which is right around the time of fall equinox. Again, it happened in the Sharad season. Okay, so that's what I showed. That's what we just covered. I also took you through each uh, some seven instances, specific instances from the biographical details of Bhagwan Ram, their corresponding dates in the Julian calendar. And I showed you how the seasons match. Now, if you're not familiar with Ramayana, the story, I would encourage you to actually go to Valmiki Ramayana with translation or otherwise, look at those events and look at those descriptions and then look at the right side column, take these dates and see if they match with the season or not. In fact, you will find no other claim for the dating of Ramayana can match the seasons and all of this like what I have shown. So this is kind of where we stopped last time. Now we are going to bring it together. So one more thing that we have not addressed, Adityaji, is this. There is a, besides this shift in the English calendar, we'll just use the word English because that's how it is known in India sometimes, referring to the Gregorian calendar or the Julian calendar uh, because of the colonialism uh, by the British. What, you have, what we have not discussed so far is the change of star positions in the background and what that has to do with the seasons and the Indian lunar months. So Indian lunisolar calendar, there are not many places which has got a functional lunisolar calendar. Actually, I would say for most part, there, I could, there could be some small exceptions. China uses it in some fashion. I'm sure there may be some other countries that I am ignorant of. But as far as I know, broadly speaking, it is the India which has still preserved the lunisolar calendar. Now, India or Greater India, like, you know, for example, the in Persia, like so Iran, they will still celebrate, the, especially the Parsis, the Zoroastrians, Zoroastri, Zoroastrians, they will celebrate their new year in a different fashion. Same thing in China. And frankly, it could be true in many other parts of the world that somehow they have retained the memories from ancient times. But my point is, what if we want to recreate not just the Indian lunisolar calendar, because it exists, but what if we want to recreate the ancient Indian lunisolar calendar? And I'm going to just walk you through in a minute. Do you know what this will have? This will, I say will, this does have, but because it's not popular yet, I'm just saying this will have it become, if we make it popular, these uh, tropical solar months, similar to what we have in the Gregorian calendar, but actually better than the Gregorian calendar. Now the correction may look very small because as I said, the Gregorian calendar is actually a very good functional calendar, but there are some errors still and it will do a better job. We don't have to go with uh, the artificially decided which month gets 31 days, which month gets 28 days, 29 days and 31 days and 30 days, but actually we can let the astronomy decide. I'm going to show you the calendar, which we already have. A, it's a functional calendar where a certain months, solar months can actually have up to 32 days. Okay. And certain solar months will have 29 days. Okay. We will still have uh, the so-called, what you say, um, extra lunar, uh, sorry, extra leap year. But that is only because we have to match it with the Gregorian calendar because that will remain functional around the world for a foreseeable future. So we are not uh, uh, talking here of a replacing a calendar just on an emotional basis, but we are referring to a improving the existing calendar, assuming people truly want this to happen. Okay. And what could be the benefits? That's not the part of this discussion. Okay. Now, tropical solar calendar, it is 
critical for synchronizing season with calendars. Gregorian calendar, which is functional now, or Julian calendar, which is used to study ancient events, both are, in a sense, truly tropical solar calendars. And this is the answer. I have given it in the previous two episodes. This is the answer again, guys, why we do use a Julian or a Gregorian calendar while studying the ancient events of deep antiquity of Indian civilization. Okay. Now, what about sidereal solar calendar, which is to say a month in the solar calendar is referred to by the position of the background star for the sun's position or a moon's position. Guess what? Where is it? Well, there is no sidereal solar calendar. And I'm sure somebody will come and say, well, the here actually is. In astrology, you kind of refer to it. For example, if you know your star sign, such as Aries and Gemini and Taurus and Leo and Cancer and so on, guess what? That was synchronized in some fashion, in an informal fashion, about 2000 years ago, when possibly the Julian calendar was in vogue. But because of the phenomenon that we are going to just look at, and we have discussed this many times on Sathology, the precession of the Earth's axis, guess what? That background sidereal arrangement, the star arrangement for the different zodiac, that has shifted with respect to the Julian uh, calendar or the Gregorian calendar we follow. So that's why I'm saying the truly accurate sidereal solar calendar does not exist. Okay? What about the lunar calendar? Well, guess what? Lunar calendar is always sidereal. It's always sidereal. Now it has its limitations. What is the limitation? Purely lunar calendar without reference to the solar calendar will never able to keep up with the seasons. Okay, because seasons are governed by the position of the sun. And therefore, the beauty of Indian astronomy, going back, I'm talking, listen to this carefully, you don't fall off your chairs, going back to at least 40,000 years ago, 38,000 BCE and before, they already existed a lunisolar calendar. Because for a daily uh, routine, they understood they need to do this with by knowing the position and the phase of the moon with respect to the background stars for daily purposes, weekly purposes, monthly and fortnightly purposes. But over a long period of time, to maintain this calendar in synchronicity, in synchronization with the seasonal calendar, you have to have a solar calendar. And that's why it's called a lunisolar calendar. Okay. So lunisolar calendar to synchronize for what? The days, months, the short term, but also the long term. And I don't mean just years, but actually the centuries and the millenniums and so on and so forth. Okay. All right. So this is the this is the answer to if people, for whatever reason, just because they are driven by accuracy and precision, or if they are driven by emotion, you decide what is your motivation when you ask that question to me through social media or email or uh, whatnot or wherever after my lectures in question answer session. Like why do Indians not use Indian researchers not use um, or a you know or people who do not like to use a specific religious calendar why do they not go for a truly astronomical calendar it exists okay now this just creating this this is a very simple version of it for a reason it took me eight years okay from 2012 to 2020 um, finally one of the if you can read at the bottom you know this is a collaboration between me and one of the oldest living family of panchanga makers in India. They are known for their accuracy. They are known for their precision. They are a very good blend of the ancient and the modern. They use, may, they make use of all the ancient algorithms from different Siddhantas, okay, of India, Aryabhatiya, Surya Siddhanta, whatnot. And they also have the latest data and latest algorithms, um, latest uh, polynomials, equations, whatnot from like jet propulsion lab that coming from the NASA data. So here I have two versions. One is English, another is in Hindi. It's at the top called Bharat Dinadarshika. As a reference point that everyone around the world understands, we have the Gregorian date because that's how 
we are conducting our business today, right? What day is it in the office? Yeah, that's given by the Gregorian calendar. So we have to always refer to it. Uh, okay, so 16 July 2021, for example. Saura date, 25. Now, this one, I'm not going to go into the detail, but this is basically coming from ancient Indian narratives, from Yajur Veda. Okay, just like we have the 12 names from January through December, Yajur Veda has uh, names for the tropical solar months, for the solar calendar. And how old are they? Not to belabor the discussion, I'm going to simply say they are much, much older, definitely much, much older than 14,000 years ago. Because the Ramayana that happened 14,000 years ago is frankly more or less clueless. It sometimes refers to these names that are there in the Yajur Veda, but just rarely. Same thing with Mahabharata. So the system of the truly tropical Indian solar calendar was actually not in use or not in the mainstream use by the time of Ramayana, which is 14,000 years ago. I'll not go through the detail. One thing that I added, so you can recognize the day, that's, that's very easy. Uh, the Ayana, like, you know, whether you are in the, the sun is in the southern hemisphere or in the northern hemisphere, that's that Ayana. The season, it is given in the name as an Indian name, Varsharutu, like a rainy season. Okay, the solar month from the Yajurveda is given. Then the lunar month designation, including the definition of a fortnight, Shukla versus uh, Krishna or Vadya is also given. Tithi is given that, and then the nakshatra is given. That gives you the phase and positions of the moon. Okay, so some of the basic things are given. There are many other things in a typical calendar. They are not shown here. And what you see on the other side is basically in Hindi. The most important thing that uh, is a part of this calendar is a true reference point of a historical event. Think of Gregorian calendar was done with the assumed birth time of Jesus. Now, I'm not saying that there is anything wrong with it in now at this especially now that everyone is used to it. But if you want to look at any historical event of ancient times and specifically in the context of India, it is a Mahabharata. And a very specific year based on like a 300 plus rich internal evidence, 300, I mean, 1000 plus empirical data points coming from 20 different disciplines of hard science that nail down that date to 5561 BC. Then you add a 2021 that gives you 7582. So just like right now, we use the reference of a zero as a CE BCE interface. The Mahabharata Samvat can be used in principle as a reference point. So anything that's happening after. So today somebody is born, let's say Adityaji, and you have to say, okay, which day or whatever, let's say which year he or she is born, and we'll say 2021. Well, yeah, and that's nothing wrong with it. But you can also say, oh, this person is born uh, MS. 7582, Mahabharat Samvat 7582. And if you have to refer to any events like Ramayana before Mahabharat Samvat, we can always call it, we have a tradition here, like before Common Era, we can call it BMS, like before Mahabharat Samvat. So facilities there, truly tropical months, truly functional lunisolar calendar. Okay, so that's what we have. Now, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to, um, so Adityaji, if you want to interrupt me, you can, because I'm going to go to the different application. And uh, uh, just want to show you some things that is also a frequently asked question. Um, do you want to interrupt me, Adityaji? No, no, please continue. Yes. Okay. So now I, I might have spoken fast also. So guys, just relax. I want to take you, you know, this is a change of gears very much related to the calendar. But another question, it is also frequently asked question, and it is this. Many people, and I'm telling you, I mean, this is an academic discussion we are having. I mean, we have students and professors and researchers and faculty and whatnot. This is a question that comes to me frequently uh, from all over. And not many people comprehend that because of the precession of the Earth's axis, okay, no difference to the tropical uh, calendar. Why? Because anytime the sun is in the extreme north, we call it the day of summer solstice. When the sun is in the extreme south, from as seen from the northern hemisphere, 
we call it the day of winter solstice that's given when the, the you know we know exactly how to detect the equinox equinoxes spring equinox that's given but when we start looking at the lunar calendar and i said lunar calendar is always sidereal calendar because how do we decide the name of a specific lunar month by noticing the position of the full moon of that month against the background reference of a nakshatra so here i'm going to show you something so let me reset this this point is the point of vernal equinox in our modern day calendars it's like 21st of march okay so let me start this so now the moon is making complete rotation so that's one month lunar month now here is another lunar month and here is another lunar month and so on okay and also the sun is going through uh this ecliptic its own path as seen from the earth okay and when it completes and comes to the same place again which is at the point of vernal equinox we say that one tropical solar year is complete okay so here i'm going to just do it manually so this one complete one year is complete how do we decide what season is going on that depends on the position of the sun so if the position of the sun is here right now and if it was interactive i would have asked you we can say right now the season right now meaning when the sun's position is at the vernal equinox it is the halfway point of the spring season everyone can understand that right now when the sun goes and here it is at the end of a spring season and now it is getting into a grishma season okay which is what the summer season okay those two months now it's the end of summer season in the indian context we have a typical monsoon that begins around the day of summer solstice or just after so that's the rainy season and so on okay now in order to define the lunar month we need to know the position of the full moon okay so i'm going to get to here and see the show you the position now in order to know the position what do we need we need this reference of the background nakshatra systems which are bright stars in the uh, gregorian calendar we talk about the 12 zodiacs okay which are also there in india but indian system also makes use of the 27 nakshatra like along the path of the ecliptic of the sun that is you know it it refers to certain stars the whole 360 circle is divided in 27 equal areas so that's the 13 degrees and some odd uh, minutes okay of area so what happens here is this okay now this time is 302 let me say for example take you to uh, our times all the way 2000 okay in our times so what will happen okay so here if i start this let me reset and then just start this look what happened here this fmp stands for full moon position so at the time of a full moon as seen from the earth what are the relative positions of the sun and the moon they are exactly opposite of each other right they are as if like earth is between not exactly between if it is comes exactly between then there is eclipse but directionally speaking earth is in between the sun and the moon now this time if we have to define now aditya ji i will ask you that question so this is the sun this is my full moon and this is the background nakshatra arrangement how do i decide the name of that month lunar month by simply looking at the position of the full moon so how do i know the position of the full moon from the earth i draw an imaginary line that goes through the full moon and try to see what is the background nakshatra so what seems to be the background nakshatra it is chitra here seen from it so that's the month of chaitra so what happens in rishi we were not yeah. able to see your app you cannot see my app no oh so i'm just talking to myself that is yeah. no i was i thought that you are talking you are just explaining so no okay how how about this now do you see it yes now we see oh my my apologies sorry okay i'll not uh, okay so let me just show what i did here my my apologies okay so let me do this okay 
just clean clean just i'll go fast again over what i showed so earth is at the center sun and moon are going around the earth okay so right now we start the solar year okay the true tropical solar year begins with the day of spring equinox that was the case everywhere around the world okay no exception for example like the march you know the month of march that's like a marche you know start <laughs> begin get set go that's how that where the word comes from in fact there is another proof i can quickly give you is think of it how do we know that the march is the first month now of course we use january well start counting from march okay so march april may june july august so far it's not very clear that what am i doing but august is my sixth month okay if i started from the march and now look at what happens to the next month september september october october na 8 september 7 november 9 december like decimal place right that is deca that is a 10 so still in the our current calendar this old system has pre, is been preserved unknowingly unconsciously september october november december those are 7 8 9 10 if you go backwards you will find march is number 1 very interesting the tropical calendar has been preserved okay that is the same thing everywhere so the solar tropical calendar always begins on the day of spring equinox you will see this in ancient indian literatures that go back based on their dating to 5000 years ago 10000 15000 20000 30000 35000 very very consistent no exception okay now what i was saying is but for daily purposes the uh, luni luni calendar is based on the position of the moon okay so what i want to do is to know the position of the moon i am going to first add the seasons so right now we will say uh, this is what you see on the calendar is the season of the spring why because sun's position is in this area of a vasanta rutu so for example let me just stop here so now moon is gone moon is going to make a circle in 30 days amavasya to amavasya or full moon to full moon but as long as this sun is within this boundary of a vasanta we will say it is a vasanta rutu okay now if we go further now this is the end of vasanta rutu now the beginning of a grishma or a summer season when that ends and when sun is at the end of this which is to say at the day of summer solstice it's the end of summer beginning of a rainy season and that's what i was saying but then if you want to know the lunar month how do we figure this out in a indian system now i will talk of a islamic system for example what they do is they simply have the 12 names given to the names of the moon but they do not look at them as a in reference to the background stars okay that's very important but looking at the background stars is how indian system does it and there is a reason for it because you don't have to remember anything independently suppose just like that movie um, uh, tom hanks movie i forgot the name now willy or something like this like lost away like he's lost on an island right working for fedex <laughs> um now if you understand indian lunar solar calendar guess what it doesn't matter which hemisphere whether you are in the southern hemisphere or northern hemisphere you if you can look at if your knowledge of all the nakshatra is good the zodiac is good and you also know how to spot the moon in the sky hopefully not that difficult but also note down the the uh, phase of the moon the crescent or full moon or what not uh, the total 15 or 30 different phases of the moon and also you know the nakshatra the background stars and if you know the phase and position of the moon guess what you might have Uh, been on the ocean without any reference point for few days few months and but you go there you will know exactly which month which lunar month is going on that's the beauty of that lunar calendar so now what i'm saying is if you want to know what month it is well you need to know this background system okay so we are still talking of our times so what i am going to do is this so now just imagine we start here and 
I am going to take this moon to the full moon. So the, this is where Aditya Ji, my question comes to you. So what month, what lunar month would this be? And the answer is we decide the name of the lunar month by looking at the position of the full moon as seen from the earth. So here is the full moon that is always all opposite of the sun. We extend this back into, extend this imaginary line in the sky to note down the background nakshatra. And what would you say? You say, ah, the full moon is near Hasta or near Chitra, somewhere there. So the month or this, or this lunar month is going to be either Chaitra or Falgun, one of the two months. And we'll not worry about how, do, how we decide which one. But that's the point I was saying. So let's stick here. So my position of my sun, and we are always going to do it here just for our demonstration. The position of the sun is at the vernal equinox, which is to say it's a spring season. And the position of the full moon is going to be near Chitra or Falguni, near Hasta, somewhere in that region, in our times. 2000 CE, 2020, 21 CE, and so on. Somewhere there, it has to be, okay? Because the full moon has to be opposite of where the sun is, you know, so somewhere in this region. So what, what does that mean? The lunar month of Chaitra occurs during the Vasanta season in our times. And now we want to know how long that lasts. I'm just going to show you an example. Suppose, let's go back to the beginning of the, uh, Julian or Gregorian calendar. So I'm entering zero. Now you notice what happened? Again, I'm bringing the position of the sun right at the point of vernal equinox. But now if I do the full, want to know the full moon position, notice what happened. It's no longer near close to Hasta and Chitra. It is near Swati and Vishaka. Why does that happen? because of the precession of the Earth's axis. Therefore, the background nakshatra at each cardinal point, they change. So if I go back 2000 years, guess what? This lunar month of Chitra or Chaitra is still going to fall within Vasanta, uh, Vasanta or spring season, but it is going to fall into the early part of spring season. Okay, I'm going to show you something else. What if I go back to 2000 BC? So I'm going back by 4,000 years, okay? Just as a limit. Now, what do you see? See, the Chitra is gone here, Hasta is gone here. So if I go back 4,000 years in the past, during the spring season, the lunar month would no longer be Falgun or Chitra, but it would be either Vishaka or Jeshta. I hope everyone gets that. If I go back to 2000 BC, Okay, if I go back to say Mahabharata times, we'll do two more scenario, which is going back to 5561 BC. Again, I'm uh, making sure that the position of the sun is at the vernal equinox, which is like day 21st of March in our times. Okay, now what happens? If you want to know the position of the full moon, say, let's say you do it here. Ah, the middle point is like a Ashad. So the lunar month would be Ashad and Shravan. If you go back to the uh, uh, Mahabharata times, more than 7,500 years ago. And quickly, I'll do the last one. And then we can take some questions. Aditya Ji, I'll take your questions if you have any. I'm going to take you to Ma Ramayana times. That is 12,209 BC. Okay, what this simulation does is it shifts that precession of the Earth's axis correction. Okay, it makes that correction. So I'm going to bring the sun again right at the point of vernal equinox. So in the Ramayana times, during the Ramayana times, during the spring season, okay, because sun's position is right at the middle of spring season here, Vasanta Rutu, what were the lunar months? The lunar months were the month of a Bhadrapad and month of a Ashwin. This is Ashwini here. So during the Ramayana times, the spring season coincided with the lunar months of Bhadrapada and Ashwin. And we see the descriptions of that in the Valmiki Ramayana. And one more thing I'll do. So during that same Ramayana times, if we go to the Sharath season, which is the pre-autumn season, equivalent to 
what we see here as a 21st of September, right, as a middle point. So I'm going to stop it there. What is the what is the lunar month during the autumn season, pre-autumn season of Ramayana times, 12,209 BC? So here, look at the full moon position. Aditya Ji, can you show, can you say what would be the name of this full moon? I mean, name of this lunar month? This will be... Uh, you have to draw a line here. Look at the nakshatra. Chitra Swati. Uh, yeah, Chitra Swati area, right? So it will be the month of Chaitra. Chaitra, that's right. Yeah. So Chaitra in our times occurs during the spring season. But if you go back 14,000 years ago, the Chaitra month occurs during the Sharad season, almost exactly opposite by 180 degree opposite. This, this is when now you combine this together and I'll stop. So now we have a slight change to notice in the Gregorian calendar, like starting with the Gregorian calendar, we have to understand the change that happens when we use a Julian calendar, just purely on the months and when the uh, spring equinox would be and a fall equinox would be and solstice. But then we have to add one more complexity. Uh, if we are understanding, I mean, if, if I say the word complex, people worry. No, we have to add another interesting thing, if I say, right, which is to note down the lunar month, which corresponded with a specific season, whether it's a Mahabharata times, Ramayana times, or any other ancient event. Just like if you go back, like uh, when uh, Julius Caesar was uh, attacking some area, you know, the lunar months were not exactly same uh, with the seasons as they are today. So Ramayana times, when the sun was in this area, therefore the sun was in a pre-autumn pre area, which is to say, therefore it was a fall season. It coincided with the lunar month of Chaitra here, you might say, and Vishakha. So Chaitra and Vishakha. So this first month would be Chaitra, another would be Vishakha, or you maximum, you might say Falgun and Chitra. That is something that people need to keep in mind uh, for example, when they uh, consume or read my books, you know, both the, all three books for that matter, the Vishma Nirvana, when did the Mahabharata war happen and the historic Rama. So that is specific to my books, but it's not big. I'm not discussing this because of my books. I am saying these, this is a reality and we have to understand the reality. If we want to understand how the ancient events and their dates were determined, but also because Indian civilization made use of the lunisolar calendar as seen in the Valmiki Ramayana text, as seen in the Mahabharata text, as seen in the Rugveda portions, Yajurveda, Atharvaveda, Upanishad, Brahmanas, many of even the Puranic text. That is precisely the reason when sufficient data exists, we can actually determine when these ancient events happen. So with that, I'll stop. Adityji. So that was, uh, I, I'm, I'm curious. I don't know if you get to see the comments, like if people found this, everything going above their head or actually they, some of them could actually relate to it and enjoyed it. See, the uh, most of the astronomy discussions have been made into an occult science in the academic, Western academics. And uh, generally people leave it to NASA. But, uh, <laughs> but in the Sanatan Dharma, uh, you know, the intelligence is considered when we discuss it in you know, day to day activities. That's how scientific Sanatan Dharma is that looking at the stars. And, and I think I must tell you all the viewers, honestly, after I started working, we are working hard, me and Nilesh, Nilesh spends more time in research. After I started working with Nilesh, I have bought a telescope and I myself observe the stars now because earlier I used to read the shloka, I can memorize the shloka. And therefore, I can have the references there, but I did not bother to check. And and since I use Mac, most of the softwares are not available. Hmm. And so, so that's a big problem for the Mac world. Uh, so some people have a joke that Mac is vegetarian and Windows is non-vegetarian. <laughs> <laughs> carnivore, right? Windows is carnivore. Carnivore. <laughs> so, so I think the app developers have to do a lot of change. A lot of change. And, uh, and they have to build these apps for the Mac users also, like poor Mac users, because mm -hmm. it is Mac is actually, for me, is dumbing down all of us. Yeah. 
Yeah, and one more thing I want to add. Now, not everyone listening would be familiar, but they have a reason to become familiar. So what I showed, for example, uh, like in our times, the lunar month of Chaitra coincides with the spring season. But if you go back 14,000 years ago, it coincides with the Sharad season. Okay. Now, this is a very natural outcome of the astronomy phenomenon, well established with the modern science, modern astronomy, but also the ancient Indian astronomy, well established in both cases, sufficient evidence. But some uh, person, some individual, okay, just thought that this is my invention. And I should thank that person, right? I mean, if I can get to take the credit for this precision of the Earth's axis, which is credited to Hipparchus in the Western world, and Surya Siddhanta and Aryabhatiya and all the Indian texts talk about it very beautifully, indirectly, but beautifully. Then that fellow gave even a name, one of the inspiration that, you know, um, like I got into this area of archaeoastronomy was Dr. P. V. Vartak. I mean, he passed away a couple of years ago. And so this individual who <laughs> failed to understand that this is the most common, most basics of astronomy, a normal phenomenon. I don't know. He, he What is the name he gave? He, call, he calls it uh, Vartak because the name of my inspiration, Dr. Vartak, Vartak Oak, my last name, hypothesis. So what I want to say is, First thing, uh, I would like to thank that individual for giving me the credit for discovering this phenomenon or inventing this phenomenon because he thinks this phenomenon doesn't exist. Okay, so let's not worry about that. But I was, since he calls, he has already given me the name, like, you know, so Vartak Oak hypothesis, just on your show, just to conclude, I would say it's not a hypothesis. It's a well established principle, not by me. But if people like to give me the credit of that discovery or invention, hey, who am I to complain, <laughs> right? So let's call this Vartak Oak Siddhanta, Vartak Oak Theorem, because it's well established, okay, and people can use it. So it is a simple outcome of the natural astronomy principle or astronomy phenomenon of the precision of the Earth axis. There is no contribution on my part other than I'm trying to, just like you said, it was left to NASA or it was left to esoteric circles. My goal is to bring it to common masses. So we'll, we'll rename this video as Vartak Oak. Uh, Siddhanta or Theorem. Theorem. Vartak sure. Oak Theorem. Vartak Oak Siddhanta. There you go. If, any, <laughs> Good if, idea. Any, if anyone wants to debunk it, they can always come on the show and do it. Yeah, but I would like to thank them first for giving me the credit of this basic phenomenon. I mean, Hipparchus would, if Hipparchus is around, he will start worrying, you know, he says, by God, this oak is taking the credit. And all the Europeans and the American professors or Western academics who are watching this show and also the Indian academics who are following them, all of them. And the Indology is a very notorious word nowadays. Uh, because many fake artists, con artists get passed on as Indologists. And uh, it has nothing become nothing but the group of people, who, not all of them, there are some good Indologists also. Of course. But with, with conditions, with asterisks, three asterisks I'll put over there. With three asterisks is people who follow the Audrey Trashkes, Wendy Donigers, <laughs> And all those people, they come in the Tamsik category and then Rajasik category and then Satvik category. Satvik category are more Satholists than Indologists. But still, read Ramayana original and Mahabharat original and check. You know, uh, Nilesh Ji has put it out on a video and followed the uh, Sanskrit shloka, which is mentioned there. And to a unknown commoner person like me, also, seasons change based on the calendar, Earth's movement of axis, North Pole, South Pole changes. Yes. Uh, North Pole, South Pole is not constant. It is uh, mentioned that during the pralaya, during the half day of Brahma, the Earth keeps changing. Even today, it is tilting. And you can observe it when the sun rises. If you keep observing the sun, it goes true east, true north, and then true south. It oscillates, uh, not true north, I would say in between it, it oscillates between north and south from our vantage point. 
so when the bhagavat puran writes about the in the in the uh, fifth canto in the fifth canto of panch panchwa varsh or panchwa skand whatever you want yeah. to call it uh, in that it mentions about subterranean planets and movement of the earth moon and uh, and different planets it does mention the the references reference points of the earth is always taken from the point of view of manushya hmm. so when the bhagavat purana says sun revolves around the earth yeah. it is a different perspective they are saying for us correct but we can understand it okay correct so in correct. and and for the scientists for the nasa scientists i will say that based on vyasadev i can challenge you that <laughs> this is the according to vyasadev so don't blame me you can blame always vyasadev you can blame all the time but according to vyasadev the earth's uh, the seasons and earth's movement is always taken earth centric view yes not a sun centric view which is a mistake yeah you know would you like to well, add anything it's not yeah yeah i will add few things it's i wouldn't say when that other is a mistake but what you said very beautifully which is to say uh, all we are trying to figure it out is for earth we are not living on the sun <laughs> so therefore it, therefore it is a earth centric even patanjali you know bhagwan patanjali in his yoga sutra he has three sutras very beautiful he is saying for example bhuvan jnanam surya sanyama if you are focusing if you are meditating on the surya meditating doesn't mean just blindly meditating you know actually noticing its position you get to know about the earth what is that about the earth the seasons how it is changing and then the you know vegetation and what not and then it adds quickly to and i'll stop then it says chandre tara vihadnyanam if you meditate focus study the the moon's positions and emotion you get to know about the whole astral uh, landscape why because um, at night time right during the sun time you're not going to see them and the last one very beautiful almost you will see that as a contradiction it says dhruve tad gatidnyanam why is a contradiction because dhruva which means steady one who doesn't move he says if you focus on the north pole star or north pole point you get the knowledge of the motion and a movement how beautiful sure. because to know the knowledge of the motion you need something that doesn't move something that is a steady which is used which was used in the western world as a unmoved mover in christianity to even explain the presence of god and what not but i'll stop on that i'll bring back the gayatri mantra also which is hmm. commonly recited 24 syllable om bhur bhuva swaha like the again the bhur bhuva hmm. swaha like the again the sequence is mentioned and uh, you know one thing is that this gayatri mantra has been so constant Mm. Uh, has never changed and yeah. uh, people write elaborate commentaries there is a book i found is a 300 page book written on this gayatri mantra and the mm. author is unknown mm. and so so there are mantras also comply with that so there are multiple uh, documentary evidence of the earth centric view because we are living here we are not living like you said rightly that we are not living on mars or moon they are trying to go to mars and moon but they will again bring back the rocks so So let us see what happens. But till that time, uh, thank you for all the scientists and also the, after this show, you'll all become astronomers. I'm sure. <laughs> and, thank you. Uh, and you can practice at home. Namaste. Namaste.